we've moved on from the announcements that we had last week of John baptizing and and now he is before the Jews in Jerusalem and the priests and Levites came to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but he said freely, I am not the Christ. Who are you then? Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you a prophet? No. Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Some Pharisees who had been sent questioned, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was doing his baptizing. Words from the Lord in the house of the Lord. This time of season, it's, a, it's about fulfilling prophecies. It's about making clear what the promises from God have been. And not the least of which is the fact that John came ahead of time announcing that Christ was now coming. So it is time. And we, we look at the, the, the trouble and the travel that John and, or Joseph and Mary and the baby had because the baby had the trouble getting home. Right? He didn't have any trouble getting to Bethlehem. But if you look in, in the second chapter of Luke, there's one line, one little line, that we build all of our Christmas pageants on. And it says, she laid the baby in a manger because there was no room at the end. Now we build Sunday school pageants and we build church pageants and we build all sorts of, of scenery in our churches because of that one little line. It's the only place where it says there was no room at the end. The important thing is that, that they came to be where they needed to be in order to fulfill a prophecy in Isaiah that said the, boy, the baby would be laid in a manger. That's the only reason that there was no room at the end. That's the only reason that she was there. It's the only reason that this had to happen. But because God put in motion years and years and years before this happened, what was to happen in our current Christmas season. And, and we celebrate the birth of Christ. We've got to forget celebrating the birth of day of Christ because we don't have any idea when it is. It was a cold season, we think, because she did wrap the baby warmly to put it in the manger. It was probably a fall or winter season. Christmas happens to coincide very closely with an old uh, pagan custom of celebrating the solstice because that was the shortest day of the year and the longest night, which meant that this was the time when the pagans began to know that the next day and the next day and the next day and so forth would be a little longer than yesterday. It would be a rebirth of the seasons. It would be a, a, a coming of the spring so that the planting could go by on and that the, the harvest could ultimately follow. And since the pagans were already celebrating like crazy and having a big party time, those who wanted to celebrate the birth of Christ just tagged it on. Said, oh, they're having a party, let's go too. That's how we schedule Christmas where we schedule it. And we finally, some way or other, probably some legislature somewhere said, we got to have a holiday. Let's call it, they probably threw a dart at the, at the calendar. And said, oh, December 25th is what we hit first, so that's, our, that's Christ's birthday. And the birth date doesn't make any difference. It gives us a place to celebrate. It gives us something to dance around and, and, and to point to. But we celebrate the birth, not the birthday. We celebrate the coming of Christ, not the fact that he was any particular day was more important than any other day. For he came to be all things to all people for all time. And we get, we get hung up on, on little details so often 
when it isn't necessary. The important thing is, is, is to have a feeling, have a spirit, have, have a connection to the celebration of his birth. The hymn you just sang, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, was written by Charles Wesley in 1739. That coincides with the time that he was in Georgia, which may or may not have been where he wrote it. I don't know. But he came to Georgia to be the uh, secretary for General James Oglethorpe and the keeper of records pertaining to the Indians in that area. But he still kept on writing those hymns that he was famous for. This is one that happens to be singable. Probably because the music is by Mendelssohn and not by Charles Wesley. So. But this is one of his 2,000 hymns and this is one of his good ones. And we, it doesn't point to a day, it points to an event. And it isn't just a Christmas song, it isn't just for Christmas Eve when the, when the angels came to the, to the shepherds in the field. It's for every one of us, every time we pause, to remember and to think about the fact that the angels came to reveal things to the prophets so that they could reveal things to us. The angels came to John to tell him, now is the time to tell the people that the Christ is coming. When you have a dream and it affects you greatly, the angels are singing again. When you have a feeling that you ought to be involved in something that's going on, the angels are singing again. So Heart and Herald Angels is, is not just a Christmas carol. It's a song for every day, every life, every year. Because it's time for us to remember that Christ isn't just once a year. Christ isn't one day a year or one short season a year. Christ is every day. Christ is every day, every year, always. And we need to celebrate. We need to celebrate his coming. And he's reborn again every time that you stop and remember how much he loved us. So much that he gave himself. Here I am preaching Easter. But Easter and Christmas are so intertwined that you cannot preach one without living the other and you cannot live one without preaching the other. Advent is a, is a season of anticipation. And we're almost to that season of celebration. But we should be in a season of celebration all the time. All the time. Because Christ comes to us in our moments of need. Christ comes to us in our most dire situation and in our greatest joy. I shared yesterday with a, with a family that came, yes, to cry and to, and, and to weep, but also came to celebrate what a wonderful life had been given up so that they could learn, so that they could know, so that they could feel the presence of Christ in their lives. And when you go to a memorial service or a funeral, listen for the words of hope and the words of promise that are always, always there. Because God gives us each new day. He gives us Christ again each new day. John was questioned by the, the Levites, the lawgivers, who said, who are you? And he said, I'm a voice in the wilderness to prepare the way for Christ, to make smooth the way for Christ. And that's what we are. We're voices in the wilderness to touch those lives that come to us for assistance, to touch those lives that we can find wherever they are. And if you participate next Saturday in the delivery of the Christmas dinner boxes, you'll go to some places you would never want to live. I promise you that. You would not want to live in those places but you will be able to bring hope and joy for a moment to people who have not known joy for a long time. You will be announcing the presence of Christ in their life. You will be the voice in the wilderness for them to say, we're here because we care. And the only reason we care is because God 
gave us Christ, who first loved us, long before we had a chance to love him back. That's what Advent is about. It's about an announcement. It's about an anticipation. It's about the coming of Christ into each life, each day, every time it happens. And he doesn't come into your life at one time. He doesn't come into your life just once. But he comes every time you turn to him in prayer. He comes every time you thank him for all his mercies. He comes every time that you have an opportunity to tell someone else about the power of Christ in your life. That's what the trip to the manger was about. You've probably all seen the, the thing that's going around on the internet about the first king-sized bed. And when you open it, there's a manger. See, he came to us as one of us so that we might understand the full scope of the love of God. For God sent his son to die. God sent his son to die, not to live for us, but to die for us. And first we had to anticipate his presence in our lives before his death could have meaning for us. What a gift he gave to us. What a wonderful love he has shown for us. And we feel it each time we take the time in our busy schedules to pray to listen for God's word. To be led to do something for someone that wasn't part of your schedule. But rather, called by God to do his work. We come to the manger to find Christ. We come to the manger because Christ awaits us as a new birth in our life, not just a new birth in the world but a new birth in our life each and every time we come to be one with him. Make straight the way of the Lord. You're called to be just as much of a clarion as is John the Baptist. You're called to tell people. No, you're called to show people the way to Christ. You, you are the one. Amen.